Okay, this is lecture 21 of our African American History Survey from 1877 approximately to the present. I have broken the Civil Rights Movement or the direct action part of the movement up into two parts, dividing more or less at 1961. So this first part is going to cover the time period from immediately after World War II to about 1961, and then Lecture 22 will pick up where this one leaves off. Okay, um, during the 1940s and early 1950s, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, like many movements for social justice or economic equality in the United States, was really hampered by the Cold War. As you guys know, African Americans and the Communist Party had mutually assisted each other during the 1930s. There were issues like the Scottsboro Boys case, unionization, and the formation of organizations like the Southern Negro Youth Congress and the National Negro Congress that there was a lot of cross-fertilization between communists and African Americans, and there was overlap. But this cross-fertilization was undermined by the Cold War because the U.S. and the Soviet Union had been allies during World War II, but as soon as the war was over, um, the Soviets grabbed a large amount of Eastern European territory and made that into their satellites. That was the Warsaw Pact countries that you see here shown in red on the map. And uh, the United States, in turn, allied with uh, Britain, France, Canada, and eight other countries to protect itself into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, that promised mutual aid in case of an attack by the Soviets on any NATO member. All right, so you've got an Eastern Bloc, a Western Bloc, and an Iron Curtain between the two of them. There was also a fear it, during the Cold War that the Soviets had a kind of fifth column or secret set of disactivated or non-activated uh, revolutionaries living in the United States. And so in March of 1947, President Truman issued an executive order establishing a loyalty program to confirm federal employees' loyalty. And then in 1950, Congress passed the McCarran Internal Security Act. Uh, it was so extreme that Truman vetoed it, but Congress passed it over his veto. The act, the McCarran Act, established loyalty review boards, empowered the federal government to investigate any individual or organization, and anybody who was found to be disloyal could be fined or imprisoned or even deported. The Security Act defined disloyalty in very broad terms as belonging to or sympathizing with a, quote, foreign or domestic organization, association, movement, or group of, or combination of persons designated by the Attorney General as totalitarian, fascist, communist, or subversive. Okay, so belonging to the Communist Party, whereas it had been sort of totally fine in the 1930s, by the late 1940s is defined as an offense that can get you a fine or a prison sentence or deportation. The United States government was uh, competing with the Soviet Union on many issues uh, during this time. There was this idea that, you know, the Soviets didn't have or shouldn't really have anything that could appeal to American citizens. They were godless communists who, um, you know, didn't believe in the nuclear family. So the United States thought that they were sort of ahead on all issues, but the one sticking point for the U.S. was civil rights. The U.S. lag on civil rights and racism was embarrassing to the United States, and the Soviet Union really tried to make as much of it as they possibly could um, in order to play up that weakness on the part of the U.S. Um, in order to kind of pretend that there was nothing wrong in terms of civil rights, the U.S. government created something called the Jazz Ambassadors Program, where it sent jazz musicians to promote American culture abroad and to show, you know, that here African Americans like Dizzy Gillespie were um, 
treated as celebrities and were cooperating with the U.S. government to spread sort of cultural diplomacy. So uh, the Cold War, as we're going to see, is going to change a lot about the civil rights movement. Okay, um, the U.S. government cautioned American citizens to be on the lookout for anybody who was, quote, subversive and wanted to destroy the nation from within. Anti-communist fervor in the U.S. made black political organizing difficult. Racists and political conservatives um, said, you know, the free enterprise system and the Constitution protect private property, and that means we also should have the right to discriminate against people. Communists, in turn, were both against racism and against a free enterprise system that exploited workers and an economic system that was highly unequal. So the black freedom struggle had a bit of a problem. I mean, if you didn't want to be lumped in with the communists, you really couldn't critique social inequality or um, lack of educational opportunity or lack of health care or lack of housing. All of these things could be somehow painted as communist concerns. In the midst of this fervor, in 1949, W.E.B. Du Bois was interviewed by Congress, and he spoke out very firmly against um, the United States' Cold War efforts to root out communists, and in turn, he was charged as an unregistered agent of a foreign power. While the First Amendment had previously protected the kind of free speech that Du Bois um, engaged in. During the communist uh, Red Scare of the 1950s, the political climate didn't really allow it. In 1950, Du Bois became the chairman of the Peace Information Center, which advocated general disarmament. The State Department uh, revoked his passport for eight years. Some black activists were deported. Others, like Langston Hughes, were subjected to humiliating uh, interrogations by the House Committee on Un-American Activities, or HUAC, which really was trying to discover if anyone had any communist connections with their past uh, whatsoever. There's Du Bois in the picture. Here is another um, African-American activist being interviewed in front of HUAC. You can see it was pretty um, intimidating. All right, so how did black organizations respond to the purge of the communists? Well, some adopted conservative measures, like, for example, the NAACP kicked out any left-leaning radicals within it. The organization did not support Du Bois when he was investigated by the State Department, and it also dismissed him from his post as director of special research projects. The NAACP also passed a loyalty resolution at its 1950 National Convention, and it said anybody who um, was related to communists or um, any branch that came under communist domination should be expelled from the organization or have its charter revoked. The black organizations that did embrace loyalty programs did so to gain an advantage in the political climate. In so doing, they said, look, we're willing to hew to what you're saying here and stick to just a political critique. And in turn, you, the nation, have to follow through on your commitment to freedom. Adopting loyalty strategies helped black organizations survive, helped them to dismantle visible signs of segregation and enable more black citizens to vote. But the strategy also required that they abandon some other freedom agenda items. Economic justice issues like inequities in employment and housing and education were just pushed to the wayside because they were too hard to prove. Racial barriers rooted in de facto segregation, um, that is the segregation that just kind of happened as opposed to being um, enshrined in law, that got pushed to the uh, to the side 
The election of 1948 revealed the difficult position in which black leaders who embraced loyalty programs found themselves. Former Vice President Henry Wallace ran for president on a third party ticket and argued that loyalty programs and the Cold War and anti-communism were all reinforcing racial inequalities and economic injustices. And he said, hey, let's eliminate racism in labor unions and educational institutions and employment practices. And you can see here a uh, poster from that campaign, Jim Crow Must Go. This is kind of a nice poster. I really like uh, the way that that's drawn there. President Truman combated Wallace's stance by, first of all, putting a civil rights plank into the Democratic Party platform that endorsed the findings of the President's Committee on Civil Rights, and also kind of accusing Henry Wallace of being a communist. So um, African Americans had to decide, are we going to support Henry Wallace, who is really, really committed to civil rights, or are we going to support Truman, even though he belongs to the Democratic Party, which has historically been associated in the South with racism. Well, Truman said he was going to support anti-lynching legislation, that he was going to desegregate the armed forces, that he was going to prevent discrimination in voter registration, but he didn't say anything about fair housing, employment, or education, and ultimately, African Americans chose uh chose Truman over Wallace. It made it easier for Truman to win since the Democrats also put up a segregationist candidate, or you know some Democrats did, it was not the official Democratic candidate, but Strom Thurmond of South Carolina kind of um, leached off some of the uh, white supremacist vote, and this was another thing that uh, contributed to Truman's election. And as you know from the other day when we talked about World War II, Truman did, in fact, uh, desegregate the armed forces. Okay, so now we're moving on to, in the post-Brown period, the Southern Civil Rights Movement, that part of the Civil Rights Movement that, in general, is associated with nonviolent protest and with Martin Luther King Jr., one of the first things that sort of kicks off this era is a reminder that although lynching may be a thing of the past, um, and maybe it's not, uh, violence against African-American bodies was not a thing of the past. In 1955, a Chicago 14-year-old by the name of Emmett Till visited his cousin in Mississippi one summer, and it was claimed by a young white woman that he had whistled at her and attempted to talk to her. And these were things that, while not illegal under the law, were uh, generally um, violations of social norms. African-American men were not supposed to even make eye contact with white women. And Emma Till was beaten um, by uh, two white men, and he uh, was killed. Interestingly enough, toward the end of her life in 2016, the woman who reported having um, been spoken to by Till and whistled at said she lied about that allegation, that it didn't even happen. Anyway, Emmett Till was a young boy who was really sort of persecuted by Southern social norms and uh white supremacist uh, terrorism. And unlike the lynching victims of the past, um, Till became a cause celeb. Till's mother, Mamie Till Bradley, held an open coffin funeral so that the world could see her son's battered and disfigured corpse. More than 50,000 people came to see Till's body. The black press published pictures of the body and these images helped to fuel a burgeoning movement against Jim Crow. I will be showing you that picture uh, on the next slide when I get to that point. So um, if you are somebody for whom uh, that is going to be very difficult to look at or uh, whatever, you're, you're going to want to just um, fast forward a few seconds when I finish this slide. In Montgomery, Alabama, in the mid-1950s, 
The Women's Political Council was planning to boycott city buses in order to fight segregation. Now, black women were the ones who mostly took the buses to get to work. Black men had more access to cars to drive. But women often worked as um, domestics within white people's houses, and so they had often far to travel on the bus. But in order to ride on the bus as a black person, you had to get on at the front of the bus, put your money into the um, fare machine, then exit the front door and re-enter through the back. Sometimes buses wouldn't even stop for black passengers. Sometimes they would pull away after the people had paid, but before they got on the bus. All right, so that's bad. But then once on the bus, black riders had to sit at the back of the bus and there wasn't a specifically hard and fast section about where the black part of the bus ended. It was if there were more white people on the bus that needed seats, anybody who was in the first row of the African-American section had to get up and move. Um, God forbid a white person uh, could be expected to sit next to a black person. Everybody in that row had to move. Well, the Women's Political Council was looking for a black patron who they could use to launch the boycott. And they decided on Rosa Parks, who was a 42-year-old secretary at a local NAACP chapter. She was a veteran civil rights worker. She was a social justice advocate. And she set up this whole thing. It was not, oh, she was so tired. She was so old. She didn't want to give up her seat. She was a test case. She was expelled from the Montgomery bus on December 1st, 1955, and this set off the boycott. The Montgomery boycott lasted almost 13 months. African Americans organized carpools, and they established a new organization called the Montgomery Improvement Association in order to sort of run the boycott. Um, African Americans endured a whack, uh, wave of anti-black violence, terror, and harassment, and the town even sued the boycotters under this 1921 statute that said boycotting was illegal. That makes no sense to me. It's still something that I find very, very puzzling, historically speaking. The boycott, though, was effective. It forced the bus company to lay off drivers, to raise its fares, and to cut its operations. Ultimately, in February of 1956, Fred Gray, a local attorney, filed a case in court, um, and it got all the way through the courts uh, in about a year. The case was, oh, there is Emmett Till, um, and you can see there how tremendously disfigured he was uh, by that beating, and this was what people saw in newspapers and in person. Um Back to the Montgomery uh, bus boycott. In the case of Browder versus Gale, the court declared that segregated buses were illegal. Local black struggles for freedom, like the Montgomery bus boycott, captured the nation's attention. African Americans across the country took up collections to support the Montgomery boycott. Others sent shoes and warm clothes. Pacifist groups like the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the Quakers took up collections. Jewish groups sent money and lawyers to the NAACP. And news media outlets like the New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune turned the local boycott into a national and international event. The black church became a focal point of the black freedom struggle. The Holt Street Baptist Church was the nerve center of the Montgomery boycott and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. became the foremost leader of the entire freedom struggle uh, as a result of his leadership of this Montgomery boycott. Okay, so here's a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. standing in front of one of those buses. He was born in Atlanta to a father who was a Baptist preacher. His father, Martin Luther King Sr., was a harsh disciplinarian a pillar of bourgeois respectability, and belonged to a very conservative and fundamentalist church. Martin Luther King Jr., by his teenage years, was thinking a little bit differently. 
He fulfilled his parents' expectations in one way by sort of following his father into his occupation. King went to Morehouse, a historically black university, at the age of 15. He graduated at 19, and then he went to theological seminary where he really was attracted to social gospel ideas. The social gospel is the idea that Christianity is not neutral on the subject of poverty, but rather it's the responsibility of Christians to promote social justice, to care for the poor, to care for refugees, to care about social inequality. While his concern for social inequality was unusual and sort of groundbreaking uh, within that Baptist church at that time, many of his other views were conservative. He was very conservative on the role of women, believing they belonged in the home. He was very punctilious about his appearance because he wanted to combat the white stereotype that African Americans were dirty. After getting a PhD in divinity, he went to Montgomery, Alabama, which at that point was a backwater. He was only 26 years old when the NAACP coordinated that bus boycott. And he didn't start off as the leader of the movement, but he was asked to speak, and he was such a great speaker that he quickly rose to that position. Black women kind of cohered with King's belief about gender inequality. They were the foot soldiers of the movement rather than leaders. They conducted fundraising activities. They organized events. Black men occupied the most formal leadership roles, um, despite the role that Rosa Parks had played in the struggle. King is notable for having been an adherent of the ideas of Mohandas Gandhi, sometimes called Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was an Indian politician, a politician in India, who began to fight against British col colonization and colonialism of his country uh, in the 1920s. The British had been sort of colonizing India since the late 18th century. They really had quite the stranglehold over the country by the 19th century. And in the 20th century, they were still there. And Gandhi started using a strategy called passive resistance. Now, passive resistance involved various kinds of peaceful protests that were meant to show that you, the protester, are nonviolent, that you have the moral high ground, and you kind of want to make your um, enemy attack you and show himself to be immoral. Just to give you one example, the British levied very high taxes on salt, but salt was a huge necessity for food preparation in hot climates. And so Gandhi's followers kind of broke the law by making their own salt. So they avoided the tax and they really pissed off the British. It took a really long time, but ultimately Gandhi's um, techniques wore the British down, and they did leave India in 1947. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. took Mohandas Gandhi's passive resistance tactics and kind of combined them with the New Testament theology of Christian love. So it wasn't just that passive resistance was going to get things done. It was going to be that people were going to see Christians suffering, and this suffering would force the nation to change. He also believed that unjust laws should not be obeyed. And he said, um, all of these objectives, we have to balance them with, with patriotism because this is Americanism. You know, to treat people equally is what America is all about. Racists, in turn, he said, were un-American and blacks were patriotic. All right, so there's Martin Luther King Jr. with his idea of passive resistance. And we're going to see how passive resistance gets worked into many of the strategies and tactics of the first part of the civil rights movement. During the years between 1957 and 1963, African Americans and their white allies launched a multi-pronged attack that ultimately triumphed over segregation and disenfranchisement. King and Ralph Abernathy, who was another minister in uh, Montgomery at that time, and others formed something called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And this was new. Churches had kind of stayed out of the black freedom struggle up until this point. 
But because um, white citizens councils were so good at getting membership lists for NAACP branches and cracking down on people using the law, if you could start up a civil rights movement in the church, due to the American emphasis on freedom of religion, you could avoid having to give the government membership lists or to allow the government to peek at what you were doing. So the um, Southern ministers now begin to really be involved with these kinds of passive resistant protests. Another organization that was created at this point was created by Ella Baker, who you may remember from all the way back in the um, 1930s lecture. She's the one who wrote about the Bronx slave market. Um, Ella Baker was still involved with civil rights uh, she had worked with the Southern Christian Leadership Con uh, Conference for years, but she didn't like the way that it was top-down leadership style, that it was very male-centered. And so she organized a new organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to focus on desegregation and voter registration. This happened in 1960. And SNCC, as it is nicknamed, was really the main organization that was organizing college students um, to protest in favor of civil rights during the 1960s. Another nonviolent protest was uh, sit-ins. Now, as I said to you in a previous lecture, there had been some kind of proto-sit-ins in the 1940s in Chicago. But the sit-in that is taken to start the whole movement of sit-ins took place on February 1st, 1960. <clears throat> Four students at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College, a historically black university, challenged segregation in restaurants by sitting at the Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro and requesting service. Uh, Woolworths appeared in pretty much every small town throughout the South in this time period, and they, they did have a lunch counter, they did serve food, but black people were not welcome at the lunch counter. They would only be allowed to get takeout. So they sat at this counter. They were not served, but they came back every single day with more white and black supporters. People were tremendously rude to them. They screamed at them. They poured ketchup and mustard and salt and sugar all over them. They punched them. Um, but ultimately, they and others like them across the country forced uh, Woolworths and other lunch counters to um, integrate their restaurant service. There were 54 sit-ins in nine states and 15 cities across the U.S., Finally, the Congress of Racial Equality organized Freedom Rides starting in May 1961. And during these Freedom Rides, uh, teams of interracial activists rode together on buses traveling from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. They were planning not just to integrate buses, interstate buses, but they also were trying to integrate bus terminal facilities, including restrooms, lunch counters, and waiting rooms. White resistance stopped them in Alabama. One bus was firebombed outside Anniston, and violent mobs rushed riders in Anniston and Birmingham. President Kennedy ultimately directed the Interstate Commerce Commission to outlaw segregation in facilities under its jurisdiction. So in other words, for buses and other kinds of transportation that were moving between states, the Interstate Commerce Commission had the authority to say, no, you can't have segregated bus terminals. And Kennedy follows through and orders this integrated. All right, so you can see that passive resistance up until 1961 does appear to kind of be working, that there are some um, limited gains that are being made. We will see where all that goes uh, in lecture 22, and I will see you in the comments.